Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Jamima Pierre. She is the Haiti Americas Coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace and an Associate Professor at UCLA. Dr. Pierre, welcome to Pushback. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. As we're speaking, it's been over a week since the assassination of Haitian President Jovenel Moise. I'm just wondering what you think is important for people to know right now as details remain unclear about what exactly happened. Yeah, so there is an assassination of a sitting president in Haiti. Um, one of the first things I want people to, to know is that the last time there was an assassination of a sitting president in Haiti um, was in 1915 and right before the U.S. invasion and occupation of Haiti for 19 years, from 1915 to 1934. And so people know this history. And one of the first things that has emerged, you know, is this assassination should not lead to more foreign intervention in Medellin, especially from the U.S. Um, in Haiti. So that's the, that's the first thing. Um, and then I can talk about, um, uh, you know, Moise as being, you know, to think about the assassination of Moise in Haiti, we have to think about, um, we have to go back um, um, to, to, to talk about the last decade, um, how Moise came to power, um, because Moise's, uh, Moise's presidency was without much mandate. Moise had been ruling by decree for the past 18 months. Um, there was hardly, there was no sitting parliament. Um, he let all their mandates, um, uh, he did not organize elections. So there, there are no members of parliament. There are only 10 elected officials in, in uh, left in Haiti. Um, judges have not been, um, mandates have been um, finished. And so Haiti, the man was ruling by uh, uh, was ruling by decree, and one of the and, and right before his you know towards the end of his life, um, Haiti was marred by a lot of violence, a lot of uh, a lot, especially gang violence. In fact, the week before Moise's assassination, there was a, a, a mass, a major massacre uh, on June thirtieth um, in uh, this neighborhood called Delma Thirty Two that killed about nineteen people overnight, including a young activist and a journalist. And so there's been rising violence, but also rising protest against Moise, who was not a popular uh, candidate at all. And he was he hasn't been popular from the very beginning because there were, his elections were marred by irregularities from the very beginning in 2015 and 16. Um, and he was handpicked by the previous government. But under Moise, the protests kept going um, I know they're hardly covered in the, the U.S. mainstream press, but there have been ongoing protests against Moise in 2016. The largest ones came in 2018 and 19, and 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 as recently as March, when Moise, for example, um, when Moise um, did not step down when his when his term presidency ended, and so there was there was discussion. There was uh, um, there were conflicting, not conflicting, but. Haitian Civil Society and the Haitian Constitution and the Federal, the Bar Association of Haiti all said constitutionally his term ended February 7, 2021. He refused to step down and said his term ended February 7, 2022, and then um, and, and proceeded to maintain power, maintain power. And in that in that process, from fe February through June, there were massive protests against him. Um, the Haitian people calling for him to step down. And the major protests really came in March and April. And then soon after that, you had a rise in gang violence, which really curtailed protests, and which is why a lot of people think that violence was linked to, you know, violence was state, uh, state sponsored. And so there's a lot to know about Moise. The other part is the only reason Moise um, could stay in power and could rule by decree for as long as he did, despite the years long massive protests against him is because he has the support of the so-called international community. And this is the important part, is that nothing happens in Haiti without the international community. And by the international community, I mean the United Nations um, stabilizing group, which is still in Haiti, has been in Haiti since 2004. Um, the core group, which is a self-identified, self-defined group that has representatives from the European Union, um, the U.S., Canada, um, several European countries, and a couple of countries from South America. And the core group basically makes all decisions about what's going on in Haiti. 
And then you have the United States State Department, the U.S. State Department. So these are the people that decided that Moise, for example, um, could stay in power for an extra year. So the protests, especially in March, from Haitians and uh, on the ground in Haiti and in the diaspora, has been against this imperialist control of, of Haiti. Um, and so I'll stop here for now. And if you have any questions, because part of the thing is we have to go back to talking about Moise's predecessor and before him, the the, the coup d'état that actually opened up this Pandora's box for, for Haiti and Haiti. So before we go to Michelle Martelly in the period before even that, let me just ask you about. Do you have any speculation as to what happened here with Moise? There's been a lot of conflicting reports, uh, video of people being arrested inside Haiti, including alleged Colombian mercenaries. What I never got about that is that if there was a plot to assassinate the president, and especially if they're foreign mercenaries, it would seem to me that they would probably escape the country right afterwards. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, and, and there was one more detail I want to ask you about, which is that, you know, there was a suspect, according to Haitian authorities, who the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration of the uh, U.S., the Drug Enforcement Agency, just uh, acknowledged was a former informant who is reportedly a suspect in the killing. Right. So first of all, I, it's fascinating to me that to carry out an assassination, you need 28 people to storm a presidential residence, right? And so, so part of that is, I have to say, you know, most of the people I talk to in Haiti, no one believes um, that, um, everyone believes that this wasn't, you know, so let me just first say that we're all speculating, okay? So I, I, I want to say that. But a lot of people believe that this was an internal and inside job, especially because um, a lot of, you know, none of the security, none of the presidential security um, and some people say there are about 20 security people were around the president in the evening. No one got shot. No one, no one got hurt. None of them were out. None of them um, were, were, the only two people that were shot were Moise and his wife. And so, and it's also speculation as to who is the one that took Moise's wife to the hospital, including to also take his daughter. Um, and then the Colombian Colombian mercenary question is really interesting because there they've always been mercenaries. You know, they've been under Moise. We know that there were mercenaries hired, for example, during protests, um, and mercenaries hired to protect um, the presidency, to protect his people, to protect some of the elite. And so there could be any you know number of reasons why you had all these Colombians there. There could be also reasons to believe that there's a bigger mastermind that we won't know about. Um, because some people pointed the figure uh, a finger at the elite, so there's speculation speculation going everywhere. But what is concerning to me is that you know the prime minister who was appointed as interim prime minister, he had already resigned the day before, and the day of the assassination, there was supposed to be another prime minister, another appointed prime minister sworn in. This prime minister names himself president calls a state of siege, which really literally means martial law for the next 15 days, and then asks the U.S. military protection for infrastructure and stabilization. And so we have to worry about that. And then also the person leading the investigation, Leon Charles, the Haitian chief of police, is not quite being questioned, even though he has a long history of human rights violations. So after the coup d'etat 2004, he was the Haitian chief of police um, that worked with the U.N., to really, uh, 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 and to uh, cause, uh, you know, to um, to massacre a whole bunch of people, especially in the, 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 the impoverished areas in the city. And so he was so brutal that, you know, there was human rights reports about him. Um, and then he left, he, he basically was forced out of Haiti and, and was attached to the U.S. Embassy um, from 2006 later. And so he was not brought in until the fall of 2020, which also raised a lot of concerns for people in Haiti about around human rights. And in fact, his first week um, in office was when he really uh, uh, repressed a lot of protests against Moise on November um, 18th. And so, the, so to have these people running the investigation, these are the people who are in charge of, of Moise's security, it just seems extremely convenient to me for some of these stories that are coming out because I'm wondering why is no one questioning the, uh, the head of uh, the, the, the presidential security? Why, you know, why are none of the guards being questioned? And how did they know, for example, there was already exactly what, 26 or 28 Colombians 
where they were, and so on. And so, you know, I can speculate too and say there are a lot of unanswered questions. And also, you know, the people who could be implicated are running the investigation. And it's really um, fascinating to me that the first thing that this um, de facto now president would do is call for U.S. military intervention. Which the U.S. has reportedly denied, right? Denied, and then this morning, um, they opened up, they opened room for this intervention, right? So then you have, so they denied it, and then this morning, it was reported that um, Biden would provide critical support for Haiti in the form of support with gangs, um, help with, with dealing with the gang situation, which, as you know, was, you know, the gangs have been in Haiti for a while, but, um, you know, the elite sometimes hire gangs, um, people hire gangs, the state sometimes works with gangs. What's been happening in the past uh, a few months, the past couple of years, it's just been the extremely, ar- you know, like the fact that these gangs are extremely well armed with expensive uh, automatic weapons and ammunition. And so the, the, the Biden administration said um, it, would, um, it would help with the gang stations, but also secure elections which the Haitian people have been protesting against from the, for the longest time because we, they were saying that this is a de facto president with no elected officials. A de facto president cannot then name an election co- uh, commission because none of that is valid. And so Haitian people have, say, have been saying that, how could you have elections when you have a completely undemocratic situation? But the US is pushing on these elections. And so this idea that they will provide election security opens up this space for potential, um, well, more intervention, because what the U.S. has been doing in Haiti is continuous intervention, but this would just be more military officials there in Haiti. Well, this brings up what you mentioned before, the uh, the installation of Michelle Martelly, who ended up basically choosing Jovenel Moise as a, as a successor. So let me ask you to talk about the critical role of the U.S. in installing Martelly uh, and thus leading to Jovenel Moise. Right. So Marta Lee, um, you know, was installed uh, in the 2010-2011 uh, elections. So we have to remember in 2010, January, Haiti suffered a, a, a devastating um, earthquake that some said killed hundreds of thousands, a couple hundred thousand people, um, with, you know, leaving a million people unhoused, um, with, you know, a, a major... And then soon after that, because... We can talk into about 2004 later. Under UN occupation, you had the UN troops bringing cholera um, to Haiti, which caused a cholera epidemic. With people say that killed between 10 and 30 thousand people, which we'll never know because a lot of people were in, in, in the rural areas that were not counted, but also sickened a million, almost a million people. So under while Haiti suffering from you know uh, uh, no housing, it's the you know uh, dealing with the 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 left of, you know, what's with the earthquake and the losses that happened with the earthquake and cholera, the U.S. was insisting on getting rid of the sitting president at the time, which was Rene Preval, and insisted that the Haitians have elections. And the U.S. put forth about $38 million to force these elections and handpicked their, the people running. And but except for one um, guy, uh, I think June, June Celestin, who ran, who the U.S. did not not support. So the first round of the elections, um, Martelly does not make the does not make the cut to go to a runoff. And Hillary Clinton, and this is like at the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring in, in early 20, uh, was it early 2011, Hillary, Hillary Clinton flies from the Middle East and flies to Haiti and WikiLeaks files, you know, will 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 demonstrate this and basically threaten the sitting president of Haiti, Rita Proval at the moment that they could put him on a plane to Africa the way that they did to, to Aristide if he doesn't agree with the OAS and, and the U.S. Uh, 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 view that Martelly should be in the runoff. So this tells us, right, first of all, that Haiti has no sovereignty. But second of all, it tells you that Martelly did not even make the first round, and he was forced onto um, the ballot for the second round, which had some of the lowest turnout because the 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 Electoral Commission, which, which the OAS helped the vet, completely banned the largest political party, which is uh, Aristide's um, uh, original party, Famille Lavalas. So there's very few people voting. There are all kinds of uh, uh, claims of electoral fraud and so on. And Mark, and this is how Martelly um, 
uh, who, who also came with a lot of controversy. For example, he was, you know, there's speculation that he was not even a Haitian citizen. And, and, and right before these elections, Haitian passports showed up. And he was living in Florida. He had gone bankrupt. You know, he, he had foreclosed on his house. But this is the guy that then becomes the president. And this is the guy, this is, this is when the most, the latest set of troubles began for Haiti. Because Martel Lee was a neo-devirus who really, um, celebrated Duvalier, and we know Duvalier, the brutal dictator with the, with, um, that really terrorized the, the Haitian people. And, and Michel Martelly was all about Haiti's open for business, which meant opening, opening up Haiti for all kinds of neoliberal um, policies, for the fleecing of Haiti by both the Haitian elite, the light-skinned Haitian elite, as well as the international you know, business uh, elite. And so Martelly was great for the U.S. government, but, but the end, he also started ruling by decree in 2015, and he finally relented and, and stepped down and handpicked Jovenel Moise as his, um, as his successor. And so the, then we know that this, this PHTK, this political party, really started in 2010, 2011 with Michel Martelly. And under this party, and, and, and we'll see this through Moise, is that it was, that's when it was revealed that, for example, they sold $2 billion out of the Petro Caribbean Bay funds, which Venezuela had set up to help Haiti, um, you know, with development projects by basically giving, when oil prices were high, it gave Haiti uh, uh, oil very cheap um, with, uh, as loan and, and with like 1% interest, and Haiti had 25 years to repay. And, and so that way they were able to, they, were, they would be able to use this money um, for development. And the U.S. was very upset by the Petrocorib, which is one of the reasons they were, one of the reasons they were uh, mad at René Breval, the president before Martelly, because they wanted Haiti to not be part of this Petrocorib funds, um, Petrocorib program. And so what ends up happening, we realize that Moise and Martelly, the whole PHDK, all became extremely wealthy in embezzling all this money from the Petro Caribbean Fund, the money that would be um, 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 for development of, of Haitian infrastructure. So, so we're here because of the, uh, you know, of this original intervention by the U.S. by forcing these presidents on us. But there's also the other intervention in 2004, where the U.S., Canada, and France led a coup d'état against the elected president of Haiti. Let's talk about that. The um... The coup against the RC in 2004, the U.S. played an instrumental role, basically forcing Aristide to uh, leave the country uh, on a plane, fi flying him to the Central African Republic. And before that, I, I guess for people who don't know that period, before that happened, the U.S. and its allies suspended some uh, millions of dollars worth of aid to Haiti, which the Aristide government was relying on for you know basic services. And I'm just wondering... If you could talk about that in the context of how vulnerable Haiti has been to external intervention and how even things like foreign aid have been used to undermine its sovereignty. Yes, definitely. You know, the U.S. never liked Aristide because he was the popular government. This, you know, this is the first time we had elections where you have 70, almost 70 percent of the people voted for this poor um, priest, liberation theology, you know, who practiced liberation theology, um, poor priest of the people and the people loved him. Uh, and if you look at the WikiLeaks file, the, um, and I have to say, Kim Eyes and um, Ansel Hurst, I think, um, did the whole session issue in the nation on Haiti and WikiLeaks and Haiti. Um, and, you know, even the Vatican um, was talking about Aristide, how much they hated him, how much they hated this liberation priest and how, how he was into voodoo and so on and so forth. So, so the first time Aristide won, which is, you know, four years after the brutal uh, uh, um, Duvalier dictatorship ended, and you had this rising um, um, a mass movement of people. It was the first time the, the Haitian masses felt in, empowered. Um, and the, the candidate that the U.S. supported did not win. And so, you know, Aristide surprised everyone. And within nine months, he was deposed. And that was 1991, the first, uh, the first U.S. Um, US backed coup d'etat against Aristide. And then he was in exile, right? And then he was in exile in the U.S. And he was the post was exile in the U.S. And people won't remember this. And, you know, I'm going to date myself. But when Aristide was in exile in the U.S., there's all this propaganda, how crazy and unstable he was. And they were doing all these, like, psychological readings of him and how he's this unstable priest. And so there's a lot of already 
um, propaganda around Aristide being like unstable and crazy and doing all kinds of things. So, so people don't remember this. And but because you know Aristide being deposed caused so much protest and so much response by the Haitian masses. And then it also because the repression after um, his 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 the coup d'état was so brutal that Haitian people started um, fleeing the island, and then of course causing an immigration problem for Bill Clinton um, and the U.S. when they started coming over in by the boatloads um, 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 soon after these uh, this coup d'état. So then um, Clinton decided that with the U.S. Marines, and this was another invasion they would come back and reinstall Aristide while in the meantime, providing a nice plane for, for the dictator, I think Raul Cedras that was there and sending him into exile in South America, uh, in, in luxurious exile, I must say, in South America. So he brings back Aristide. And this is where a lot of people actually had a falling out with Aristide because Aristide uh, accepted some of the conditionalities of bringing him back as some of the, um, you know, the fact that he came back with the U.S. invasion of, you know, of the U.S. Marines and so on, but also the fact that he agreed finally to take on, to, 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 to pass some neoliberal policy. And I think he lost a lot of support um, from leftist organizers when he, when he took that. And, and I think to this day, people might say that was a big mistake because, but then when he came back, the U.S. insisted, he'd been in exile for three years, the U.S. insisted that he could only serve the last, I think, nine months of his term, which meant that he never fully served the first term. And so he finished out the term and then, um, but then would come back and run again and winning again by landslide. And it was during this, his second term that the U.S. really used different sort of taxes. And so this is where we talk about the National Endowment for Democracy. And, as, and a, an important side note here is that um, Claude Joseph, the self-proclaimed now former interim um, Prime Minister and now self-proclaimed President of Haiti was part of the student movement in 2000-2001 um, that were funded by the National Endowment for Democracy against Aristide. So, and we can find, you find this information in WikiLeaks. Um, and so part of that is, so you have, you know, this funding of, 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 of young people, funding of um, opposition groups in Haiti. And then you're right, what ends up happening is Aid to Haiti was shifted from the state to the NGOs, who are our international NGOs. And so whatever aid Haiti got was sent directly to the NGOs, basically starving the, the US state. And they knew, they knew exactly what they were doing, starving, not the US state, starving the Haitian state, which also then uh, created more poverty for local people. I mean, if you think about like the embargo against Cuba, it's really similar to what they were doing um, George W. Bush in particular, what they were doing to Haiti throughout his time. And so by the time then, you know, 2003 comes up, you know, the, the state had been decimated. Um, there was rising um, protests and rising, um, uh, uh, rising people disappointment um, with Aristide, but not people not realizing that the state was completely starved. Um, aid was held up, the NGOs, the international NGOs had all the power. The student groups were being funded and trained by the National Endowment for Democracy. The CIA was funding um, paramilitary troops who were being funded and trained in the Dominican Republic. And then you come to um, the fall of 2003, where you have a meeting in, um, in Ottawa, Canada. It's called the o Ottawa Initiative. You can look that up. You can just type it um, to Google, Ottawa Initiative, where you have the representatives from France, Canada, and the U.S. meet. Basically, to say we need to find a situation, we need to find a solution to the situation in Haiti, and this is where they concocted um, the coup d'état against Aristide. So they meet, I think, in November or December, and by February 28, 29, um, U.S. special forces landed in Aristide's home, told him to get in a truck. Uh, the U.S. ambassador was, you know, showed up at his house and said he has to go right now. Um, took him to a plane and flew him and his family, him and his wife to the Central African Republic. And let me just read you, you mentioned the WikiLeaks cables when there was so much informative stuff in there about Haiti, but just let me read for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, just some of the documents which give a window into the uh, bitter hatred of Aristide amongst these so-called diplomats who were working in Haiti and how 
uh, not just the U.S., just how so many of them were determined to prevent Aristide from returning because as they recognized, he was the most popular politician in the country. So uh, one cable says for most of the 1990s, the Lavalas movement, which is Aristide's movement, represented the poor majority of Haitian voters and Lavalas, Fami Lavalas could run on its own. Um, they go on to say that Fami Lavalas uh, has uh, more Haitian support, quote, than more than any other single party. Uh, and one poll, quote, showed that Aristide was still the only figure in Haiti with a favorability rating above 50 percent. And another cable is written by the U.S. ambassador and uh, recalls uh, the, that ambassador's conversation with Edmund Mollet, who was a top U.N. official in Haiti. And the subheader of the section uh, about their conversation is this. Aristide movement must be stopped. Uh, Malay urged U.S. legal action against Aristide to prevent the former president from gaining more traction with the Haitian population and returning to Haiti. So that's when you have this U.N. official telling the U.S. to take legal action against Aristide to prevent him from returning from exile in South Africa back to his home country because, as the cable warns, he's just too popular with his own people. Right. And that's why they could not, and, and the, the weekly cable also show Jamaica tried to offer RSD, um, ex, you know, asylum, um, you know, when he was on the plane, when the U.S. took him out, because, you know, P.J. Patterson, um, vice, president, vice president, prime minister at the time, and, uh, and uh, was it, yeah, and completely was disgusted by the fact that, um, uh, uh, you know, he released a, a major statement saying that this is, you don't do this to a head of state. This is a coup d'etat, a foreign run coup d'etat. And, and, and uh, Condoleezza Rice threatened Jamaica and any place in the Caribbean um, with sanctions or whatever um, with the U.S. wrath if they, if they offered um, asylum to air seat. And in the WikiLeaks cable, it says having his presence in anywhere in the Western Hemisphere will cause a destabilizing situation for the U.S. and others. So that tells you not, you know, they hated him, but they were afraid of him, right? And they also didn't want to kill him because that would create, he would be a martyr, unlike Moise, right? You see the difference, right? So they didn't want to kill him. So they sent him to the Central African Republic, this, you know, this president at the time who accepted Erecid and was shocked that Erecid was there, <laughs> But he did it because he, he said, you know, he wanted some aid from the U.S. He wanted, because he himself, he had taken power um, and he wanted some aid. And then it wasn't until later that Tabo Mbeki, um, uh, you know, offered um, Aristide asylum. And so he stayed, he was in exile in, in South Africa for seven years. And the hatred of, of Aristide does not end with George Bush. It continues with Obama because right in the middle so Michel Martelly, during his, you know, once he became president, immediately um, Jean-Claude Duvalier, the, the, the baby doc, the dictator, returns to Haiti um, <laughs> and no one stops him, right? So uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier returns to Haiti and is attending official events with Michel Martelly. This is the guy that Haitians prosecute, you know, want to prosecute for massacres and, you know, between him and his dad, 29 years of brutal, brutal dictatorship. And I have a picture, and I think you've seen it, of like, you know, Bill Clinton on stage shaking hands with Baby Doc, you know, right next to Michel Martelly. So, so Jean-Claude Duvalier was brought back to Haiti, rehabilitated by the Martelly uh, 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 administration. And so, so soon after, um, uh, this is 2011, Aristide says, well, he wants to come home. And so WikiLeaks cable shows the U.S. government, Obama administration, Barack Obama himself, calls Jacob Zuma twice to try to stop South Africa from sending Aristide back, basically demanding that South Africa keep him in South Africa. And Zuma says no. And so then there's a plane, and the person that covered this very well, you know, when they were a lot more progressive was Democracy Now! and Aiden Goodman, where, you know, they fly back. So, you know, so she covers the, the, the flight back from South Africa to Haiti. Now, if this man, if, if you don't know what popularity is, you have to watch the video of Aristide landing in Haiti when he returns. 
And, you know, the thousands and thousands of people that met him at the airport that ran alongside his car caravan to his house and so on. And so the, his popularity was still there even when he returned. And the U.S. tried to keep him out. But, but, but remember, they didn't do the same for Jean-Claude Duvalier, the brutal dictator who had returned a few months earlier. So they really, really, truly hated this man, partly because he was, uh, you know, for the poor. And he was for about, you know, he always said, we want to live in dignity, right? Haitian, the Haitian people want to live in dignity, in dignity. So it's really, it's really interesting to see what then the U.S. supports, because the Marta Lee and Jovenel Moise um, presidencies that come uh, later on that are forced upon the Haitian. So the U.S. decided they would not have make the same mistake um, uh, after, after, after Aristide, that it would have a hand in actually handpicking, removing people from ballots, removing people from, from, from the election and handpicking and placing their own, their own um, people there. But I have to say that can only happen because after the coup d'etat, which George W. Bush led, and then within a day of RSC being taken out of Haiti, you have thousands, like 20,000 troops from US, Canada show up in Haiti that same afternoon. And, and so then you have this, this US, Canadian and French forces in Haiti from, from, from early March, March 1st. And then they were able to convince this UN Security Council to send a UN peacekeeping force, a so-called stabilizing mission to Haiti under chapter, under chapter seven. Now, for those people who don't know, a chapter seven UN deployment means that a country is at war and UN soldiers are allowed to use arms and, and, and deadly force. Haiti was not at war. People were just protesting the removal of their president. But the UN signed off on that. And on June 1st, 2004, you have thousands of UN troops um, show up and thousands of civilian, un, you know, civilian uh, network uh, under the auspices of the UN. And what's fascinating about this, the, the, the second occupation, that's what I call it, is that, and this is in the WikiLeaks cables as well, the U.S. instead of doing it alone was able to call was able to use the U.N. and they said it was a cheaper way to protect their interests in the Western Hemisphere than them sending their own um, their own um, military forces. So the U.N. occupation then was led the military wing of the occupation was led by Lula's Brazil, which is a problem, right? And then you had the civilian force led by some by the Europeans and, and some South Americans. So this was a very multicultural um, UN occupation force that really lasted, you know, that could that established the institutions that run Haiti right now, including the core group and, and bringing in the OAS as this key force in making and, and rigging elections, and then also hiding the US State Department's role behind this UN UN mission. Now they said the UN, the UN occupation ended in 2017 with the withdrawal of most of the troops, but there's a UN integrated office, um, the acronym is BINU, and the representative is Helen Lalee, who basically still makes all the decisions in Haiti, so much so that when Claude Joseph, one day after the, the same day of the assassination of Jovenel Moise, when he declares himself president and, and a state of siege, everybody's just like, what? This is crazy. Helen Lalim the next day proclaims that Claude Joseph will be Haiti's president until elections. Like, if, if you have a, a sovereign nation, how is it that this, if, if Haiti's not under occupation, how is the UN representative in Haiti, how can they stand up and make this claim on behalf of Haitians without, without, without a say? And as you mentioned earlier, the you know, one of the other big lasting legacies of the UN forces, Haiti, is introducing cholera, killing unknown numbers of people because the UN doesn't want to take responsibility for it or seriously investigate what they actually did. Yes. And so, you know, it's 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 it's, it's important to, to think about what this means, because the other day I was thinking about like the scale of death and misery. Um, that cholera brought to Haiti. And so and people don't think about it because people don't think about how horrible that is you know they don't think about that in terms of like large-scale massacres um because this is a war crime you think about the fact so if we think about israeli planes bombing palestinian homes destroy destroying um you know buildings like they did in the latest latest illegal and horrible attacks 
destroying buildings, destroying people, and then killing thousands, right? So, you know, every time they attack, this last time they killed a few hundred, but every time they, the last big one where they killed like 2,700 or 3,000 people. So that spectacular violence is etched in people's memories and people are outraged. But then you have cholera that within a year killed 10,000 people, right? And it's a dirty, stinking disease because all your orifices are just leaking and it smells. And it's like a, a disease that gives, allows you no dignity. And so you think about a disease that is brought in by a foreign occupation force that kills 10,000 people in a year, sickens a million, and then continues to kill people. And then they refuse to take responsibility for six years. People don't see that because they don't see the spectacular you know, violence of it. But it is violent when you kill 30,000 people. <laughs> I mean, like that's, that's a war crime. And the UN has never taken responsibility. They, they apologized six years later. And just a few weeks ago, the nerve of Ban Ki-moon to write a book and basically blame Haitians, you know, saying they're trying to extort the UN for trying to get justice for this cholera epidemic. It's devastating. And it just makes you think like people don't care about Haitian lives because to think about, just think about what it would mean to like kill 30,000 people, like, you know, just like that. And nobody says anything about it. Let me put you something that I, I heard often from a, a white Western audience uh, back during the second coup against RC in 2004. So I went to Haiti in December 2004 to just to report on the aftermath of the coup. Uh, at that point, it was being ruled by La Tortue, who was basically installed by the U.S. And when I came back to, you know, to Canada, where I was living at the time, and I was trying to, you know, uh, share what I what I saw and talk to people about it. The most common response that I got, and I still get this now from people when I try to talk about just how much the U.S. and its allies have been meddling in Haiti for decades, is that why would the U.S. want to meddle in Haiti? It's the poorest country in the yeah, Western no. Hemisphere. That's what I keep. That's like a, a refrain I hear so often because people just don't that that's what people's minds go to. So I'm, I'm just wondering it, when you hear that, what's your response to that? <laughs> well, it's also the first revolutionary country in the freaking world if the western hemisphere if not the world and which is why the white people especially europeans and canadians want to point out that haiti is poor and so i respond to that you know haiti is more than its poverty but its poverty is the result of hundreds of years of foreign meddling down to this indemnity that the French government still owes Haiti the billions of dollars for forcing it to pay reparations to the white slave owners after Haiti defeated Napoleon's supposed big time army. And so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a major open racism when it comes to thinking about Haiti. And I think Haiti has never been forgiven for destroying, um, you know, if, if only for a moment, the white supremacy, you know, white supremacy, right? But for, for taking away, um, um, you know, this idea that white is right and white is white. And so you have these black formerly enslaved people um, <laughs> um, was able to defeat the largest um, European army, basically putting fear in, 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 in whiteness, in white people, in, 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 in the, the, the people who were ruling the world at the time. So they've never been able to, been, been forgiven. And, and there also has been, as Gerald Horn always writes about, there's been counter-revolution against Haiti ever since. So the, the thing I have to always ask people, if Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, why, why, are, why, do, why do these Western nations, including Canada, spend so many millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to destabilize Haiti, trying to go into Haiti and steal its resources? If you, if you, so when you went to Haiti, you would see, so for example, American Airlines has four flights to Haiti, at least used to be for COVID, out of Miami. If you get on one of these planes, it's filled with half white businessmen and half white missionaries. And it's always interesting to me, like if Haiti's so poor, people, a lot of people are making money off of Haiti. I mean, <laughs> think about that. I mean, people make careers and lives and like whole, you know, become wealthy off of Haiti. So part of that, so part of that is 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 the idea that you know they're, they're there's not they're not forgiven for there's the racism um, for this for for Haiti, but also there's uh the, the 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 which has led to you know 
the Haitian Revolution and so on. But the other thing is one of the key missions, I think, is to destroy the remnants of the popular movement that first brought Aristide to power and to really destroy the will of, of these people who continue over and over again to not die and not succumb to the continued repression, the continued intervention. And I also think, you know, this is back in, you know, in the 1800s, Haiti ge uh, geographically is a perfect position for U.S. strategic geopolitical um, policy. So, so Haiti has this tiny island called Mole Saint Nicholas, which is in the northern part of the Haiti that the U.S. has been trying to have access to since the late 1800s. In fact, when Frederick Douglass, you know, the great Frederick Douglass, was the U.S. representative to Haiti, the U.S. sent him to actually negotiate this island from Haiti for the U.S. government. And I think if, 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 if Haiti had relented, the base in Guantanamo Bay would actually be in Mole St. Nicholas. And up until last year, you know, the rumor was that Jovenel Moise was actually going to allow the U.S. to have a base or, you know, to use part of Mole St. Nicholas. The other thing is, you also have to wonder, why is it that Haiti has the fourth largest U.S. embassy in the, in the world, right? So what is it about Haiti that makes all these people who say it doesn't matter, like Bill Biden is like Haiti could drop, you know, in the in in the sea and nobody would think about it. But they're all in Haiti all the time, you know. And why is it that Canadian mining companies are all over northern Haiti mining for gold? Why is it that oil mining is happening? Um, because they know Haiti has these resources, but they also know that Haiti is strategically located in the Caribbean because if there's a base there, you know, part of it is to use Haiti as a as to control the Caribbean basin in preparation, I think, for its impending, I think, attack on China. Because where Haiti is located, it's well, near the Panama Canal, you can go in there and, and, and Southcom, once the US establishes a firm military base, you have the Southcom, the Southern Command, so that Haiti can you know, really stop the growing leftist movements in, in, in Latin America. So you know, to try and stop Venezuela, Bolivia, um, and all these places. And so Haiti is just ge geographically um, uh, strategic for the U.S. And people don't want to think about that. But I think all of these come together um, to, 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 to make Haiti significant. I do think they're trying to basically compete, complete with the Haitian peasantry, complete um, uh, the imperial, uh, what was it, what the U.S. imperialism started in 1950, remove Haitians from their land, because Haiti is one of the few places where people still own their, you know, agricultural land. But that's been taken away, continuously taken away from them and really turn Haiti back into wage labor so that they could become like tourist havens for, for the West. And so- Yeah, that, that was Bill Clinton's big legacy where he, and he later apologized for it, you know, years later well, when he, he yeah. acknowledged that, he, that his, his policies wiped out Haitian rice farming. It has not worked. It's maybe been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that I was a party to. I am not pointing the finger at anybody. I did that. I have to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people because of what I did. Nobody else. And, and pigs, you know, and, but Bill Clinton is the, the classic abuser, right? You do the harm and then you apologize for it. Right? <laughs> Isn't that what abusers do? And, and so then we're supposed to like say, okay, so then you wiped out our rice farming. You made us kill all our pigs. So that was Ronald Reagan, made Haitians kill all the, the, the original Caribbean black pigs and replace them with white pigs from southern, the southern U.S. And so Bill Clinton to me is one of the biggest abusers of Haiti. You know, that's a whole other story right there. But, but yeah, so part of that is to really shift, you know, Haitian um, um, self-determination and control of its own resources and production into this wage labor. Because this is one of the few places that they haven't been able to completely do that. All right. Well, so we're going to wrap. So any any final words for us, what we should be thinking about as developments unfold in Haiti over the coming weeks? There's the power struggle now between, um, you know, uh, different factions claiming uh, vying for power, confusion over who the actual interim prime minister is and this investigation into who killed Jovenel Moise. What are you uh, looking for happening in the next uh, in the upcoming period? Well, what 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 I'm looking for is the, basically the U.S. is you know, is gearing up to, con to fully control the situation in Haiti. If anything, the U.S. is already controlling the narrative surrounding assassination because 
where you know you have all mainstream media talking about the details of the assassination, the salacious details, and every day the story changes, and no one is talking about U.S. imperialism and the fact that the U.S. and the U.N. and the OAS have been meddling in Haiti. So everybody's stuck in the for in the trees, you know, not seeing the forest, and so they've already controlled this narrative, right, uh, around what's happening in Haiti. So I can see that, and I also can see they're going to force elections when Haitians. Even before Moïse died, Haitian said that we could not have elections under these undemocratic conditions. And for the U.S., they want to say, well, we had elections and we brought democracy. And Haitians will not stand for that. And so it will be interesting to see how they will use the Haitian police, which they train. I mean, there's a whole story about the NYPD training Haitian police and, and all of that, right? And that's a whole, you know, we can talk about Haiti for a long time. But so look for people rebelling against this, these forced elections and then look for repression by this, you know, this guy who's fully supported by the U.S. government. And I do, but, but what you're going to look for is protest. And I think the people in the U.S., what we need to be demanding is no more intervention for, for the U.S., for the U.N., for the OAS to leave Haiti alone, leave, allow Haitian sovereignty and self-determination. So those people who care about self-determination and sovereignty in Haiti need to really rally together and fight against the U.S. State Department as it takes full control of Haiti. And if we remember in 1915, that's exactly what it did. And my worry is that it will do it again and the protests will be met with much, much more, much repression. And so we have to be prepared to fight against that. Jamima Pierre, Haiti America's coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace and associate professor at UCLA. Dr. Pierre, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Aaron, for having me.